okay, the theory part of how to do cylindrical shells. I briefly went over this last time. It's not on the videotape, so don't look for it. Uh, but I briefly went over this last time. Here's our idea. Can we take this region that's bound by our two vertical lines at A and B and F of X, revolve it around the y-axis and get the volume of that solvent's created. And I just finished saying <coughs> this. We can use the, the disc or, or washer method, but notice how if you consider this in terms of y, that would have to be two different functions in terms of y. Top, bottom, and then top, bottom. That's what you'd have to revolve around. So that, that necessitate two completely different integrals. And our question is, is there a way that we can do this with only one integral, and that's where the cylindrical shells method idea comes in. It says, yeah, you know what, maybe we do. Maybe we just consider this to be a function of x revolved around, so we have basically this idea, hopefully you can see the image I'm trying to draw, it's not that easy to draw the swept out volume of this, this figure being revolved around the y-axis. We get kind of this, I think it, I called it a jello mold last time, it looks like a jello mold to me. It's got that like cavity in there. Maybe it's an upside down pineapple cake if you have those. Oh my gosh, so good. But anyway, that's, that's the idea. And we said, what if we could take, and instead of thinking of this as washers, because it wouldn't work that well for us, because again, if you thought of this as washers, you'd have one, two different functions in terms of y, which is the axis upon which you are revolving. You got me on that? If you're going around y with disks and washers, they had to be in terms of y not x. So that says in terms of y, that's one function, and that's another one in terms of y. That would be two different volumes here that we're talking about. It'd be like this perfect cylinder volume, and then the top little piece volume. And that's what you would have to do as if you were to use washers. Do you get the idea? Now, if we talk about cylindrical shells, it says this. Imagine you have this cake thing, right? This, it has a hole in the middle, and it has some, some cake around. It's perfect perfect circular shape, and you take a coffee can, and you go, and, and you, you pull it out. What you're going to get is a cylinder, right? The top of it's going to be a little bit not perfectly straight. It's not going to look exactly like this. It's going to have a little lip to it. Does the lip actually matter for us? Imagine the idea of limits. What are we going to end up doing to the size of that cylinder? The thickness is, is of that cylinder is going to go very, 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 very small. So we're going to take out these these basically cylindrical chunks of cake, a uh, uh, coffee cylinder, a coffee can. Take it out, you get this chunk of cake. You got it? Go a little bit bigger, you got another chunk of cake, slightly bigger, like concentric circles. You get the picture? Bigger. And you keep on slicing this cake up with these larger and larger coffee cans. Now eventually, we're going to say the coffee can is increasing infinitesimally small, so they're, they're all just little circles. Uh, that are that have some sort of height to them, barely any width at all. That's the idea of that limit, right? Taking that width to zero, and then find the volume of each of those cylinders. So the question comes down: Can you find the volume of a cylinder? I don't know. Let's think about it. We want to let's go for each region. Find the volume. Would you agree that the volume is going to be the area of the cross section? times the height. We've already done that several times. If I took a cross section, that's going to give you some sort of surface area. The big circle minus the little circle, the area of the big circle minus the little circle gives you the area of the cross section times by height, and we're going to get the volume of that particular cylinder. Not your head if you're in agreement. Good, because I'm right. You should, you should know that. So we know that this is going to be the area of cross section. times height. We're going to find the area of the cross section. What is the figure? What's the shape of our cross section? Circular. It is circle. Yeah. In fact, every circle, and it, it's a washer, it is. It's a big circle and then a little circle. And we'll subtract big circle minus little circle. Well, every circle has a radius. Every circle has a radius. Let's call this one, what does it really matter what we call them? Let's call this one R1 and this one R2. 
Sorry if you can't see that, that says R2. So radius 1, radius 2. Radius 1 would be the, the radius of the larger circle. Radius 2 would be the radius of the smaller circle. How do you find the area of your cross section? Area of the circle. Area of the circle. Not just radius 1 minus radius 2. That's just going to give us a difference in radii. We want to find the area of the first radius minus the area of the second radius. So area of the cross section then should be pi radius 1 squared minus pi radius 2 squared times, oh, times the height. Times the height. And Joe said, what's the height? The function. Absolutely, you're right. The height is the function. Look at this. Can you see that the height at each little piece is going to be the function's height? Now we're going a little bit uh, beyond where we're at. We're, we're just talking about a cylinder right now. The cylinder, let's kind of imagine that it is flat. The height is going to be the function's height wherever that would be. You follow me on that? Now when we get to this point, we're going to have to pick the arbitrary point in between. That's what we're going to do over here. The arbitrary point. We'll find the height at the arbitrary point, which won't matter because our our distance between points will go to zero, saying the arbitrary point, it's fine. So times the height, well the height is the function at x. So what that means. You know what, let's leave it. Can I do this later? I, don't, I want to be very accurate about it. I don't want to give you f of x. Can I just leave it h for now? I'll work around it. I'll, I'll get you f of x over here. I want to give you h. That way I can pick an arbitrary point and be actually really accurate. So would you agree that this is the volume? Think about it. Area of big circle minus area of a little circle. That gives you the section or the sectional area, the cross sectional area times the height. That's going to give you a volume. Not sure if you're all right. I'm going to do some fancy math with you. Ready for some fancy math? Yeah. Sure. Okay, fancy. First, first math, not fancy math. We're going to factor out the pi. No problem. Here comes the fancy math. R1 squared minus R2 squared is a difference of squares. You see it? It means you can factor it as a difference of squares. Which means I can do that. Difference of squares says that. If you don't believe me, distribute it. Take this times this, you will get that statement. Now comes a real fancy math. And this one's really hard, but I'm trying to get this in terms of things that you're going to understand in a second. Uh, what I'm going to do, would you agree that if I multiply this expression by 2 and 1 half, I really haven't changed the value? Multiply by 2 and I multiply by 1 half. 2 times 1 half gives you 1. So I'm going to be multiplying by 1 in a very special way here. What I'm going to do is say, I'm going to make it 2 I use black so you see the change here. Two pi one half then all that stuff. you agree that's the same thing? Same expression? Same value at least? I want you to think of what we actually have here. If I reorganize this just a little bit, what do I want to do? I want to do Just reorganized. I move this here, move the h here, and put a bracket around the one half times the the radius one. Um, one of them be plus. We're not adding; we're multiplying. 
Well, which one? Which difference is square? Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Good call, Shane. Yeah, I made that mistake. Anything else that you caught? Are we good? Pretty sure we're right. I've just categorized, I've just organized these ones, put a bracket around it, move this here. But I want you to think of what this, this means. H is the height, sure. What is R1 minus R2? That's the second one, R1 minus R2, what's it represent over here? The thickness. That's exactly right. The difference in the radii, very good, which would give you the thickness of the shell. Do you follow me on that? This is going to be the thickness of the shell. What's one half R1 plus R2? What happens when you add two things together and multiply by one half? You get the average. This is the average of the radii. So the average of the radii, this is the thickness of your shell. So basically what I've got for you here, this is what we want to make in general in terms of f of x and x. We have 2 pi times the average radii or average radius, I'm sorry, times the height times the thickness. Would you guys feel okay getting that far on that? This row, yes? You guys okay with it? Any questions on, on how we got that? A little manipulation, but it really comes out to average radius, sure, height, and then we have our thickness. What we're going to try to do now is match up parts in terms of f of x and these things. Do you have a question? Um, for our, for our cylindrical shell, both of them, um, are both of the, since they're like two different shells in each other, does that mean that they're the same function would just have different radiuses? Same function. Same function, yeah. You mean f of x, right? Right. Yeah, this, this, this top part is flat right now because I'm trying to get you this idea. Over here, and over here, it's technically not flat. It does have a little bit of a function to it, right? Now, what we're allowed to do is come really close to the function. doesn't matter. What we're concerned about right now is how to find average radius, how to find the height. The height's going to be given by the function, so that's kind of nice. And the thickness. Are you ready to start on, on this one? Sure. It's a good question. Good question. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a shell within this cylindrical shell. One little cut. We're going to make a cylindrical cut, basically. At, oh, let's talk about where it's at. If this is x sub k, it has to stand for a random shell, right? Just some random cut, x sub k. If this is x sub k, what we're doing here basically, think about this. We're going to take, this is going to be kind of a weird concept, but, but think about finding the area, how we took little cuts, right? We took all these little sections, like this. You with me? Where each of the thicknesses were delta x. True. If I take those cuts and I revolve them also around the y-axis, you see how I'm going to get the shells? I'm going to get those coffee can things. I'm going to get the shells out of it. So this is x sub k. This one's got to be x sub k minus 1. It just stands for the previous cut. What we're going to do is, within this solid shell, we're going to make another cut. An arbitrary point. How do we call our arbitrary points? What do we label them? X k dot. Look, I'm, I'm trying to make this so you understand it from the area idea. This was like x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, x sub k, whatever it was. And we took an arbitrary cut in here, x k dot. You remember that? If we take an arbitrary cut in there, we're going to make a cut at x k dot, but that cut's going to go all the way around our figure.
Don't zone out now. Don't zone out now. Now here's the key to doing this appropriately for us. We have to choose xk dot to be the midpoint of that interval. You'll see why in a second. So make a cut at, at xk dot, which is going to be the midpoint of our section. Can you tell me something? In relation to x k, x sub k and x sub k minus 1, what's a midpoint? It's the same again? Average. We're going to use that in a second. Would you agree that if I put x k dot right in the middle of our section, it's the average of those two numbers, no matter what they are? You follow me on this? OK, so this is, this is basically the average. Average. Okay. Only two more things we have to do. What is the thickness? What's the thickness from here to here? It, 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 it's xk minus what? No, xk dot, that would give you xk one. xk minus one. Very good. Yeah, that's, that's right. By definition, hey, what, what's the thickness of any cut? Come on now, people, think back. Think back. What's the thickness of your cut? Delta x. Remember delta x? We took a thickness of our cut, it was always delta x. The thickness of our cut here is delta x, and we're revolving that <coughs> delta x around. Delta x, by definition, is x sub k minus x sub k minus 1. That's what it is. So this is delta x. Thickness is delta x. Now we can actually talk about height. I left it here as h for height. But I want to talk about the height is at xk dot. Notice how I can't, look, I couldn't really, I want to be accurate, I couldn't really give you f of x here because I can't tell you, I can't tell you what the function is, the height of the function is of this whole thing. But as soon as I pick an arbitrary point, as soon as I pick that exact point, can you tell me the height of that exact point? That's the difference. So as soon as I pick xk dot, how much is our height? Very good. Yeah. Height is f of x k dot. <coughs> Sweet. Love it. You know what? We're almost done. Almost done. Let's look at what we wanted to find. And you said you understood this, right? At least you said. Hopefully you didn't lie to me. 2 pi, constant. We were going to have it. Average radius, that's this, okay. Do we have something that represents the average radius up here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in fact, if you think about what the radii are, they are xk and xk minus 1, the average of which must be xk dot, the midpoint of that interval. We chose it to be the midpoint for a reason. So that we could come down here and say 2 pi is going to be there. Average radius, xk dot. Yep. That is the average radius times height. Height. We now know that as soon as we pick that, that arbitrary point, which happens, has to be in the middle of it, okay? It's, I guess it's not so arbitrary anymore. As soon as we pick the midpoint of it, we can find the height at that little cutting, the little cutting within uh, the like, cylinder of, co of, can of coffee cake. Something like coffee, coffee can, cake, whatever. Uh, the, that little cylinder of cake, we can go right in the middle of that, we can find the height of the function at that point. Do you follow me on that? So the height is f of xk dot. And the thickness, well the thickness by definition is just the thickness of our cut. The thickness of our cut revolved around the whole thing, revolved around the y-axis, the thickness of this piece then has to be delta x. That's not our formula. That's our formula for one individual shell of x sub k. That's one of them. How do I find all of them? No, not yet. Not a limit yet. This is one of them. How do I find more of them? I add them all up. Yes. 
This is one shell. This is an approximation for all the shells. Approximation for all the shells. How do I find the exact, the exact volume? As what? Good. Yeah, it says basically take that coffee can and make an infinity number of them. Where they go out just a teeny little, little bit. What happens when you take a limit of a sum? What do you get out of that? That's what it is. So we have volume is an integral from where, wherever our, our integral starts, our interval starts A to B. 2 pi. What happens to xk dots when I, when I take limits? What do they become? Random arbitrary. Random arbitrary points become actually just a representation for all x's, x. So f of xk dot becomes not, not x, f of x. And what do delta x's become? This is called the method of shells. Also, please note, it's perfectly appropriate to do this around the other axis. But you're going to note one thing. Please, this is where people make just big mistakes. I'll try to make it real clear. It's kind of like the punchline for us. We have a few minutes left, but it's kind of like the punchline, okay? When we did shells and washers, the axis upon which you revolve, like the x-axis, is the terms in which your function must be. So in order to go around the x-axis, you had to have in terms of x, y-axis in terms of y. Look what happens here. It switches. This is around the y-axis. It's got to be in terms of x. Okay. Around the x-axis would be in terms of y. Look it. We're revolving this around the y. It's still in terms of x. We never switch variables. So please make sure your notes are correct. This is for, I'm not making a mistake here. This is, so it's kind of to it. this is what this is correctly, okay? I'm not making a mistake. I'm doing this deliberately. This is around the y-axis. This one is around the, the x-axis. True statement. True story. True story. Now, did you understand it? Yeah. I'd like to set one up for you. Just one. You'll find out that they're, they're not too hard to set up. I, I, I want to make sure you see it before you go, because it's all been theory today, and it hasn't been anything substantial. Well, it's been very substantial, but not anything concrete. I want to give you a concrete before you go. Can you guys hang on for a minute? Man, that was a lot of work. A lot of work.
find the volume of the region enclosed by y equals the square root of x, x equals 1, x equals 4, which are vertical lines, revolved around the y-axis. <clears throat> First question I have for you. Since we're revolving around the y-axis with this method, cylindrical shells method, is this okay or not? Around the y-axis. Okay or not? No. In terms of x means your terms are x's. Solve for y. Okay, maybe this way. Around the y, solve for y. Around the x, solve for x. Okay, in terms of x, in terms of y, different. So is this appropriate for around the y with this cylindrical shells method? Would it be appropriate for, for uh, discs or washers? No, no, it's different. It's like backwards, so be very careful on that. Now, we'll set this up. Here's what this says to do. The volume is integral from, where do we start? Um, x equals 1, it's going line, going around. 1 to 4. They're clapping for me. <laughs> We're good. What goes in inside? Come on, help me out real quick. 2 pi. 2 pi. Look at what happens. Look what this says. It says x. No matter what, you're going to have an x there. So you just tack on an x. Then it says f of x. What's f of x? And then? So this is the integral from 1 to 4. We'll pull out the 2 pi. Let's do that. We have x times square root of x dx. How do you do that integral? x times the square root of x dx. What would you do? Exponents. Yeah, exactly. So 2 pi x times x to the 1 half power dx. 2 pi. Hopefully you can do this in your head. We have a 1 and a 1 half. That's going to be 3 halves. Is the integral really hard? No. Set up, just set up. 1 to 4. We've got 2 pi. The integral would be x to the 5 halves over 5 halves from 1 to 4. Simplify a little bit. You're going to have 2 pi times 2x to the 5 halves over 5. Here's probably how I would do this. I would take the 4 pi over 5 out of it, and I'd just worry about the x to the 5 halves from 1 to 4. Notice I'm taking the 4 over 5 with the pi, and I'm just worried about that piece. Now do this. It makes it easier. 4 pi over 5. I'm going to have 4 to the 5 halves minus 1 to the 5 halves. No, no fraction. That, that makes it nice when you do this. Now, 4 to the 5 halves, I know how to do this pretty quick in my head. I take a square root of 4, and then I take the fifth power, that's 32. I take 1 to the 5 halves, anything to, 1 to anything is 1. So this is 31. Hopefully I did that correctly. Right. Square root of 4 is 2, 2 to the fifth is 32. So you're going to have 4 fifths, 4 fifths pi times 30, what did I say? Plus 31 times 4, 124. Your volume is 124 pi over 5, without having to do shell, uh, washers or discs, shells. Well, we're continuing talking about how to do some volumes. Now, we, of course, we've covered some disc method and washer method. We're just getting into the cylindrical shells method, which is the idea of, I think I mentioned the cake and the coffee can, right? Cutting slices of cake out and finding the volume of each cylinder. And then we're adding up all those cylinders. So it was different than shells and washers because, I'm sorry, discs and washers, because with discs and washers, <coughs> whatever axis you're revolving around, that's what the, the functions need to be in terms of. So around the x-axis, in terms of x. Around the y-axis, in terms of y. The cylindrical shells method kind of flips that. It says if we're going around the y-axis, that's when you want it in terms of x. If you're going around the x-axis, that's when you want it in terms of y. Are you following me on that? It's, it's, it's backwards, almost like it's backwards, so that gets confusing for a lot of people. So let me ask you this. In this question, if we're going to revolve some region around the y-axis, are these formulas good the way they are, or do we need to change those functions? What do you think? If we're going around the y-axis, it should be in terms of, you need to understand what in terms of x means. Is this in terms of x? Mm -hmm. This one's good either way, by the way, if you notice that. That's, that's fine. 
Uh, is this one in terms of x? Yes, this is in terms of x. Get it in your head that in terms of x means the terms should be x terms, they are. Or solved for y. So around the y for cylindrical shells, solved for y. Or in terms of x, those mean the same thing. They have to mean the same thing to you. So again, I ask this question. If we're going around the y-axis, which we are here, is this OK? Yeah. Yes. Good. Now, we remember that our formula for the volume was what I give you, 2 pi x f of x dx? Only here, well, we got two functions. So we're going to do something very similar to find the area between two curves. Remember finding the area between two curves, how you took the top curve minus the bottom curve? We can do the same thing here. Same exact thing. We'll take the top volume minus the bottom volume. Basically, the top function will sweep out a bigger volume. The bottom function will sweep out a smaller volume. If we subtract those two volumes, what it will give us is basically the volume between the top function and the x-axis minus the bottom function and the x-axis, and that will give us the remaining volume between our two functions. So it will look very, very similar to area between two curves. For us, though, that means, well, firstly, how do I find A and B? And secondly, how do I figure out which one is on top? How would I find A and B in this case? What do you think? OK, let's do that. Let's do x equals x squared. We can solve it. And what we find is that x equals 0 or x equals 1. You OK with the 0 or 1? Yay, no, folks. You OK with it? Yeah. So we just found our bounds of integration. That's kind of nice. We already have that set up. So we're going from 0 to 1. Very good. Does the 2 pi ever change for us? So we're going to get a 2 pi. Does the x ever change for us? The x. This x. The x can be there no matter what. It's always going to be there. Unless it's a y, unless we're going around the x-axis, and then that's a, a y variable. You follow me? So the x is going to be there. What we care about finding is the f of x in this case. Now, be careful, but set it up just like you would the area between two curves. So we're going to find the function on the top, the function on the bottom, and subtract them. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Can you find the function on the top? Yeah. Oh, I hope so. How would you do it? Cool. So we got from 0 to 1. Plug in 1 half. If I plug in 1 half to x, I get 1 half. If I plug in 1 half to x squared, I get 1 fourth. That tells you x is on the top and x squared is on the bottom. Raise your hand if you feel okay with that so far. Cool. So when we plug this stuff in, we go, all right, well, f of x, it's not just one function anymore. It's the top one minus the bottom one. When you think about that, I hope it makes sense to you. Just, just think for a second. Think. If I distributed this and I broke those integrals up, what it would have is the volume underneath this minus the volume underneath this. Or in other words, the volume of the top one revolved around the y. Minus the volume of the bottom one revolved around the y. That gives us the remaining volume. You got it? Same way, it's a very similar idea to the area between two curves. Now let's go ahead and work on how to do that integral. What's the first thing you would do? Go for it. Oh, I, yeah, I'd probably pull out 2 pi as well. So from 0 to 1, what else are you going to do? Distribute. Definitely distribute. Don't try a substitution if you can do it easier than that. So most of these aren't substitutions. Most of them are pretty basic. Just a little manipulation. x squared minus x cubed dx. That means we're going to get 2 pi. I'll do it as x cubed over 3 minus x to the fourth over 4. And we're going from 0 to 1. So that gives you 2 pi. If we plug in the 1, you're going to get 1 third minus 1 fourth. I'm going to test the zero just to make sure I don't miss anything, but we're going to get zero in this case. But you want to have it in mind. That way, in case you had like a minus one up here, x minus one cubed, you wouldn't miss that fraction. So that is going to be a zero. So basically, we have two pi times. If you do that fraction, I believe you get, oh, what is that? How much? You said one twelfth? One twelfth. So we're going to get how much? 5 or 6. Now, of course, I'm going through this a little bit quickly because you know how to do the integrals. You know how to plug the numbers in. Do you feel okay with our example? 
guys over here? Yeah. Are you awake today? So we're gonna uh, get the coach on Mondays. Last week of school Monday. I know it, right? I know it. So notice that even though we went around the y-axis, we did change our variables. We had in terms of x. This means in terms of x. So for the cylindrical shell method, around y, dx, not dy. It's got to be in terms of x on that one. Let's go ahead and try one where we're going around the x-axis, just so you can see it one time. Uh, I'll talk about one more. We'll set it up, but we won't do it, and that'll be the end of this particular lesson. So we want to find the volume bound by volume bound by x equals negative, note the negative, x equals negative y squared plus 6y and x equals 0 around the x-axis. In our case for cylindrical shells, since we're practicing that right now, cylindrical shells looks like this. Oh wait, hang on. We're not going around the y-axis anymore. We're going around the x-axis. If we're going around the x-axis for cylindrical shells method, our function should be in terms of what? Y. Okay, are they in terms of y? Yes. Y's and y's. Yeah, that's great. In terms of y means solved for x. So for cylindrical, sh for cylindrical shells around the x, solved for x. Or in terms of y. So for cylindrical shells, you go from c to d, 2 pi. Am I going to have an x here right now? No. What am I going to have? Okay, so make sure you make that change. We'll call it g of y dy. What's x equals 0? This way. That's actually the y-axis. What that means is that we have a vertical line, the y-axis. That's no problem. We're going to be taking, just taking this function in terms of y and going this way with it. Now, since those are our two functions, but the second function is kind of nice. It's just a zero. How can we find our c and our d here? What would you do? Set it equal to what? Zero. Yeah, here we set the two functions equal to each other, right? That was, that was not a problem. Well, here, look at You can still do the same exact thing. You have x equals zero and x equals negative y squared plus 6y. So let's just set those things equal to each other from here. Oh, how are you going to solve it? I would do the same thing. Factor a negative y out. You're going to get... Yeah. <coughs> now, by rights, you should determine which function is on the top. The y equals zero, on the right. The y equals zero, or the, I'm sorry, the x equals 0 or the x equals negative y squared plus 6y. So plug a number in there just to make sure because you notice if you did it backwards, you're going to get a negative volume, right? If you do that, can you ever have a negative volume? So some of you on your homework who are giving me negative volumes, you're doing it wrong. You can't get a negative volume. It's not going to happen. So I'm going to take like a, a 1. Just plug in 1. If you plug in 1 here, you still get 0. If you plug in 1 here, you're going to get 5. So that means this function is on the, in this case, on the right, or on the, on the top, but for, for y functions, we get on the right. So let's go ahead and try to set up our integral. Uh, can you tell me where we start and where we stop? If you want to see this again, it'd go from 0 to 6. You'd plug in the number 1. If you plug in 1, that's still 0, x equals 0. If you plug in 1 here, you get 5, so that's negative y squared plus 6y. That's on the top. I heard some of you say from 0 to 6, you're absolutely right. What's going to come first again? Tell, help, me, help me out with that. Yeah, you know what? Don't forget the 2 pi. Some, I was doing this problem quickly earlier, and I forgot the 2 pi. I'm like, wait a second. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be a pi in there, because we're circular. So I forgot all about it. So don't forget the 2 pi. That would make a big difference. 2 pi, and then what else? Good. So this first part does not change. 
What does change is the g of y, depending on what we have first and second. Uh, what, what are we going to put for our g of y? Can you help me out with that? Good. Do I have to subtract off another function here? It would be zero. I'm not going to show the zero, but if you had a different function right now, you'd subtract off the second function. In this case, the zero would be on the bottom. Now, I forgot something kind of crucial. What am I forgetting here? Yeah, that's, that's huge. Okay, well, walk me through it again. What are you going to do? Sure. Well, we're pretty much good to go as far as our integral, integral goes now. Nothing too tricky about these besides the setup and making sure you have them just rock solid and plugging the points in. If we do that integral, we're, we're so far along right now, I mean, I don't even have to ask you for it. I know you can do it. You're going to get negative y to the fourth over four. You're going to get 6y cubed over three, which eventually we're going to simplify that down to 2y cubed. And you're going to be going from zero to six. So that's our 2 pi. If we plug those numbers in, what you get, just make sure you don't do this. Okay, watch. This negative, that does not go with the exponent. You, you know the difference, right? Yes. If I had negative y in parentheses, yes. Negative y to the fourth, no. What this means is negative 6 to the fourth over 4. It means like this. It doesn't mean with that negative included. That would change your problem drastically, wouldn't it? But instead of a positive, you get an or instead of a negative, you get a positive if you did it incorrectly. Plus, I'm going to change that to a 2 times 6 cubed. And I'm going to check for the 0 still. Now, I know 0 is going to give me 0 and 0. I'm just going to put it up there to make sure I don't forget it anywhere. That way I don't lose track of anything that I, I might need, any fractions. Now, if you do 6 to the 4th power, I believe you get 1,296. Can someone double check that for me? So you got negative 1,296 over 4. Plus, oh, you know what? I made a big mistake. Do you see it? That should be a, I don't know where I got the 2 from, it, but that should be a 6. I saw that 2. Oh, I did. Oh, I did it right. Oh, look at that. I was a genius. I did it in my head. My bad. <laughs> You know why? Because I was going to do 6 to the 4th again and divide by 3. So 12 minus 6 divided by 3 would be easier for me. So either way, whatever, 6 to the 3rd, then times 2. What do you get out of that? Now I know 1296 is divisible by, divisible by 4. It's like 300 something, isn't it? 324? So when you combine those, the negative 324 and the positive 432, you get 108. So all together, if you get 2 pi times 108, 216 pi is our volume. It's kind of a cool thing, right? Finding the volume of these, these objects. So, so far we've done two examples in like a couple minutes apiece. We've done one where the region's bounded between two curves. We take it around the y-axis. We note that it has to be in terms of x for cylindrical shells. Second one, it's bounded by two curves, but one of them is real simple curve. One of them is just x equals zero. It's going around the x-axis. It's got to be in terms of y. How many will feel okay with these two examples? I want to show you one more. We'll set it up. I'll leave it to you to finish it up because it's just going to be a basic integral. But I want to show you one more here. Um, I think I mentioned to you before that you can do many of these with the disks and washer method. You can, but it makes them harder sometimes. I want to show you that. That's exactly. So what I'd like to do is revolve the region bounded by this, this. and this around the y-axis. In order to get a, a, what exactly we're doing, a lot of times it's nice to draw a picture. 
So I'm, I'm going to give you a picture to see what this is. This actually means, okay? So I'd like to tell you, show you, the show you the difference between the shells method and the washers method. You with me? So let's get a nice picture going. That's one, by the way. So we're, we're making kind of an exaggerated picture because you're going to see that the area we're dealing with isn't very big. Now, if I do y equals x squared plus 1, note that that's a parabola, just a parabola that is shifted up one unit. So we have a, an x squared shifted up 1. I'm not going to draw the other side because it's not going to be enclosing any uh, area for us. So I'm just going to deal with half of it. Then we're going to do y equals negative x plus 1. Here's plus 1. Here's negative x. So I get that line. That's negative x plus 1. X equals 1, we talked about over here. What's x equals 1? <coughs> vertical, just like x equals 0 was vertical. Oh, I need to make my parabola fatter. There we go, fat parabola. We had an anorexic parabola earlier. I don't want those. That's bad. That's really bad. So this is x squared plus 1. This is x equals 1, and this is negative x plus 1. If we're going around the y-axis, do you guys see the area we're sweeping out? It's the area that's enclosed by those three different curves. It's this right here. <coughs> now let me tell you something. <coughs> you can do this with washers or with shells. We're going to consider it with washers first. I'll show you why we have the shell method, because washers would be a little ridiculous to do for washers. But let's talk about washers, because you really need to see it. Because on your test, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Or maybe I will, but you're going to need to know it. So let's talk about washers. If we were going this way around the y-axis for washers, would you notice that the washers would have to be in terms of y if we're doing the washer method? Around the y, in terms of y for washers. Around the y, solved for y for shells. You hear the difference, right? So if, we're, if we went around the y for washers, you'd have to break it up. The reason why is because you have three different functions going around the y in terms of y. You'd have this one. Uh, it'd be 1 minus x squared plus 1. And then, of course, you would have the cylindrical, uh, the washer's method, so you'd have the pi and this thing squared dx, like that. For wherever your bounds would be, you'd have to also have to solve those. Oh, you know what? I even, even did that wrong. Why did I do it wrong? Explain to me if I'm going around the y, why I did that wrong. Still in terms of x. So you'd have to solve these things for x first, even to go around the y. So it'd be a tricky problem. You'd have the 1, that'd be easy. But then you have to solve this curve in terms of y. Then take this curve minus that one for this interval here. Then you'd have another integral. You'd have 1 minus whatever this is in terms of y. And then you go from your bounds of integration there. So can you see the washer method here? Do you see why I need two integrals is really what I care about. Do you see the two integrals? Oh, if we're doing washer method, this one minus this one plus this one minus this one, that would be the only way to do the washer method for this example. Raise your hand if you understand that one. Yeah. Now, Shell's method says, don't care about that anymore. Shell's method says, hey, that just tells me the end of my balance. Because for Shell's method, I want these in terms of x. I want this to look like this with a top function. Look, if I erase the purple. In terms of x, this one is always on top of that one. Do you see it? Oh, that's nice. So in terms of x, if we're taking that around the y using shells, all I need to do is set up my integral from, where does it start and where does it stop? Zero to one. Zero to one. No problem. What's going to go here? Well, the same thing that always goes there. For cylindrical shells, we're going around the y-axis. We better have it in terms of x. You with me? So we have the x there. Inside my parentheses, I'm not going to have one function right here. I'm going to have two different functions. You just got to be able to tell me which one's on top. Which one is on top? And then? Minus. Like the minus what? Parentheses. Oh, parentheses. Are those important? 
What's going to be on the bottom? So, head now if you're okay with the setup for our walk, for our, our shells method. We got our, in terms of X, because we're going around the Y. That's how it works for shells method. We have the one on the top. Yeah, correct. X squared plus one. Subtracting off one on the bottom. You can really see from the picture here that if I was going around, the volume swept out by this entire curve minus the volume swept out by that entire curve gives me the volume between those two functions, between those guys. You got that as well? Cool. Top minus bottom. This is the same old cylindrical shells. If we do our integral, we're going to have our 2 pi. Still have an x in there. But we definitely want to clean that up. x squared plus 1 plus x minus 1 dx. x cubed plus x squared dx. That's 2 pi. If we do our integral, we're going to have x to the fourth over 4, x to the third over 3. We're going from 0 to 1. We'll leave that 2 pi hanging out there. Just multiply at the very end. That's probably the best way you can do these. We plug the 1 in. You're going to get 1 fourth plus 1 third. I'm going to check the 0 to make sure I don't have anything that, that's fishy about this. I want to make sure I get zeros out of them. So 0 plus 0, okay. I know I've got 0. We got 2 pi, let's see, 1 fourth plus 1 third should give you 7 twelfths. And that will be 7 pi over 6 for our volume. 7 pi over 6. Hey, we just did three pretty hardcore examples of cylindrical shells method in about 15 minutes. That's pretty good, right? Can you guys do it? I don't know. That's up to you to really handle it. Did you understand it when I was doing it? How many people did feel okay with it? <coughs> Notice it's going to be easier because I'm doing it, right? I mean, I know the setup. You're going to, if you didn't have the picture of that, if you didn't have the picture, you'd have to find out where they intersected, or at least draw the picture, graph it on your graphing calculator, but at least find out where it started and where it stopped, and then find out which one's on top, very similar to what we did over here. Then the setup, the setup is the most important part. You've got to set it up correctly. If you do, really, honestly, is, are the integrals hard? No. They're really easy, uh, the integral part of it. Plugging in numbers is just plugging in numbers, but the setup is crucial for you. You've got to get the setup right. Do you guys have any questions on these two before I erase them? When can't we use cylindrical shell? We were talking, we showed us when we can't use the washer method or when we shouldn't use it. When you shouldn't? Um, well, we can't, why couldn't we just stick with shells and go through almost, I haven't seen any problems with any of the examples we've done. Sometimes it's hard to solve for the functions. Like if I gave you something in terms of, if I did this, um, around the x-axis, you have to go in, you have to solve that for x. You have to have in terms of y, you have a square root up there. So basically whatever, it, whatever the given is, use the, unless there's something complicated to it, use the appropriate form that makes it easier, easiest to set it up. Do the easiest thing possible. Yeah. You have now two ways, right? Two methods. Three. Three. Well, two, really. Yeah. Distant washer is the same thing. And this, I mean, notice this yeah. and this was the same thing. We subtracted functions, but the same thing as distant washer. Uh, this, is like the, this is like the washer version, washer version of cylindrical shells. This is like the disc version of cylindrical shells, if you, if you will. Uh, but they're the same. So you have washers and you have cylindrical shells. Use the one that is easiest for you, the one you have to do the least amount of work. We're lazy people, right? You don't want to do it the hard way, easy way. Easy way, come on. All right, how many people feel okay about it? Do you feel all right? Any last questions before we go on? Any last words? You ready for the last section of calculus for us? Sounds easy. Um, easy. <laughs> easy is a relative term. <laughs> I'll say that the integrals will be just as easy. <laughs> it's just another formula that you have to know, really. Uh, of course, I will derive the formula for you. 